Hey, my Peters. Peter Braun, yes. Uh, I'm very pleased to have Peter Braun here to speak. As I say, I, I don't have this all in my head. <laughs> um, the interesting thing about a, a positive arithmetic is that you can express, of course, uh, real numbers with fewer bits. And sometimes, if the number of bits you're trying to express is in the petabytes, it's a big deal. And Peter was the one who realized that this could apply to a terrible problem with the square kilometer array, that their, their bandwidth requirements were just so huge that the only thing that could rescue the project might be to use positive arithmetic instead of floating point arithmetic. So very interesting hearing what he has to say about that. Peter, by the way, if it's not already been announced to many, multiple times, is, is best known as the creator of Lustre, the parallel network uh, file system. And uh, <clears throat> I just recently, just this year, learned that he's also quite steeped in numerical analysis, which you wouldn't expect for a networking guy. But he does know both sides of that coin. So uh, I think we'll start a little bit early, maybe, and give you more time. Peter? Thank you very much for uh, having me here. It's always a pleasure to come to Asia. And uh, this crowd of people interested in next generation arithmetic, I think, is a very special group of people. I'm very, very happy to tell you about uh, how you might use the things that uh, you've been working on. But I hope that along the way you get um, uh, a little bit of a feeling for what this big telescope uh, project is about. So uh, a lot of people have been designing this telescope. It's around a team of uh, over 500 people worldwide, uh, led by a head office in Britain. There are 10 or 11 countries involved. And um, I'm using a lot of materials from the various presentations we've had. It would be very difficult uh, to, to recreate some of the images and so on. Um, my, my own role has been to be a, a consultant to the computing design team in Cambridge, uh, and th this has uh, lasted for six years or something like that. I think I got there right when they started. And th this design phase, by the way, is wrapping up this year. Uh, all the pieces have been reviewed already, and now they're doing an integrated design review. So uh, the, the next phase is to actually build the telescope. Um, let me tell you very briefly a little bit about myself. I started life uh, as a mathematician, actually, uh, and, and, uh, but not really a numerical mathematician, working on, on pure mathematics. In 1992 or so, I thought that was too hard and uh, started to tinker with computers. And relatively quickly, I created a few startup companies, uh, always surrounding scientific computing and storage for the first 10 years or so. And so for, for 20 years, I worked with um, hundreds of the biggest labs in the world uh, and also with very many vendors of computer systems. I was very lucky to make these contacts. They all wanted to ship Lustre, and so I got a very nice collection of, of people I could still go and ask questions to. Five, six years ago, I started on the telescope to doing somewhat more academic work. Uh, I remain very interested, though, in um, developments in the industry, as you will see in this talk. So. Um, the, the message from this talk will be, you know, this is really a very big project um, and there is a very important synergy to solve its problems between industry and, and research. This is not something that you could just give to a company and say, bring us the computer uh, and you don't want the academics to cobble something up either. It, it's a, a very big co-design effort. Um, this project is not a computer science project, so they're not going to be buying um, the latest and greatest new hardware that maybe would be positive enabled or stuff like that, they'll have to be conservative because the telescope must work. I'm going to tell you how in a pre-hardware posit world, a pre-posit hardware world, maybe I should say, yeah, you can still benefit enormously for it and be ready for the future. Um, I'll also show you that there are actually a lot of deep questions out here that over time could change a lot of the design. So, the SK is going to be a massive telescope. Um, it, it will spread uh, over hundreds of kilometers, its antenna groups, and it should do things like image the sky a million times faster than a telescope does at the moment. Um, it will be so sensitive that you can see a little airport radar 50 light years away. 
yeah, um, uh, aliens will see them uh, in in detail. Yeah, uh, so um, whether they have legs and arms, we should be able to tell. <laughs> um, so uh, what what happens is that this turns out to be a major computing project, and the uh, SKA organization um, split up the design into many different packages. There are like six or seven, maybe ten packages. A few have disappeared, by the way. Some of these packages are about very obvious things, such as design the antenna. Um, less obvious is perhaps that you have to build power stations in the middle of the desert. Yeah, and uh, then there are computers, signal processing, electronics, um, long, uh, uh, wide area networking, and so on. So there are these ten groups of people um, uh, ten groups of, of researchers called work packages have independently produced designs that are now being glued together uh, as a design for the whole telescope. So the one I worked with is the so-called science data processor, which is shown in the center. Um, and uh, this is the last phase of the data processing before it's ready for scientists. So it's a supercomputing project in the, in the middle of this. So let's quickly compare this with a few other telescopes. So this is a big project. It will cost uh, between half a billion and a billion dollars uh, by the time it's finished. But it's actually a rather good bargain if you look at competing and uh, recent projects, uh, particularly uh, the um, JWST space telescope that the United States is developing largely stands out as very expensive. Um, also, that so it's like a next generation Hubble. That thing is going to be sent to a very, uh, very far spot behind the moon, where it would be very difficult to do any repairs. Yeah, so it's a high, high risk project. Uh, there are other radio telescopes in here, and a very big optical one. And you, as you can see, they're all uh, more expensive than the SKA, surprisingly. Um, so the target for SKA is to be like CERN for radio astronomy. Yeah, so this will be by far the best radio telescope out there, hopefully, in, in 2025. And it will have a similar model that data is generated on the two sites where there will be actually two antenna arrays built, as you'll see in a minute. Uh, and it will then be spread to many tier one sites around the world that do um, data processing. Um, Personally, I think it's rather stupid to send that data all across the planet, but uh, ownership of computers in locations seem to have um, political value or so. Um, so there is a, a follow-up plan that has 10 times more antennas called SKA Phase 2, probably might be built in the 2030s or so. Um, the problem is quadratic at the moment in the number of antennas. So if you go from, uh, uh, if you increase the number of antennas by factor 10 and you're roughly at an exascale problem, you're looking at a 100 exascale problem for, uh, for the 2030s. And it, that one looks rather steep at the moment. Um, astronomers, uh, in some cases, still are easily off by an order of magnitude. Yeah, this has changed a lot, but in the 1980s, if you were within a factor 10, it was very good astronomy. These days, sometimes you have a few digits or five digits or stuff like that. In my presentation, there are some smaller errors. And if you start digging, you'll find that the positions have shifted, but they're all within an order of magnitude. Yeah, so it should be okay for the astronomer. So here is one antenna array. So these antennas look nothing like dishes. They're called aperture arrays. And uh, they have electronics on site that uh, deals with the signals as if the thing is pointing as a parabolic antenna in a certain direction. Yeah, and these are uh, so-called beam formers that do that. Uh, there will be a thousand of these stations, each with 256 antennas. Yeah, and they are spread out over on the order of 100 kilometers. Uh, they will be built in the Murchison Desert, which is very famous for having very few people. Uh, there are 0 0.05 humans per square kilometer there. Uh, this is uh, much lower even than Siberia and Canada. I think Canada <coughs> has like three or so. So this is very hostile there, only snakes and spiders. And the reason is that telescopes don't like cell phones. And so you have to stay away from humans. Yeah, uh, the cell phone noise would lead to complicated filtering things that would have to be done. 
And they actually ask you to turn cell phones off when you get close to a radio telescope. Um, the other one looks a little bit more normal. Um, uh, this is, looks like the kind of dishes that you might imagine to see. And uh, this one will be in South Africa, also in a desert called the Karoo Desert. More people there, but still relatively few. Um, and in each case, there is relatively little power in the desert, and so the computing is going to be done in quote-unquote nearby cities. So this will be Cape Town in South Africa and Perth in Australia. And so the data from the telescope will be hauled for 500 miles or so to these cities. Funnily enough, digging in fiber isn't so very difficult. You just have to be very careful that the rats don't come and bite the fibers. You cannot touch them ever. The last mile is very expensive. Running that data through these cities on dark fibers from telephone companies, much more expensive than actually digging 500 kilometers of fiber into the desert, strangely enough. Yeah? Um, the beginning of some math. This is the layout of the antenna patterns. So you see that they have spirals uh, and a center. And you can also sort of see that there's a, uh, a much higher density of antennas in the center of these things. This looks like galaxies. It has nothing to do with it. Yeah? Uh, it is just an optimized pattern for receiving signals. It's also not exact because there are rocks and little mountains and, 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 and cracks and so on in the desert. And you can't put the antenna in the middle of a crack, obviously. Yeah? So the, it's, it's an approximate pattern. But this data pattern appears in all the computations, and its irregularity is uh, a cause of a lot of problems. Yeah, there isn't much data that comes from a pattern of antennas like this, except very large radio telescopes, of which this is actually the first one. So let's briefly talk about uh, the science that uh, people do. I removed almost all the science slides, by the way, because the, the moment you leave them in, two possibilities um, uh, uh, take place. First of all, uh, it's possible sometimes that people think I know something about uh, astrophysics and then they start listening and asking questions. Uh, that can take a very long time. Uh, just as often, people realize I don't really know a lot about astrophysics and they try to take over the talk. Yeah, and uh, we want neither of that today. Yeah, so um, um, there are roughly two things that the telescope will be looking at. One is fundamental forces and gravity and particles. And so the, the biggest questions in, in this area are what is dark matter and what is dark energy? Yeah, these have been very firmly established as being there by seeing the universe expand too fast or uh, galaxies spin faster than they could without dark matter in them. Uh, but there's no idea what this data, what, what this matter really is. Um, the second thing is magnetism. There is a lot of magnetism in the universe and it's largely unexplained where it comes from. On the other side we have origins uh, and the origins are, are very, very interesting. So most of you will have heard of the uh, cosmic background waves. They are um, a, a little blip of information we have from a very early stage of the universe, uh, just uh, like 100,000 years after the Big Bang or so. Um, after that, the universe goes dark for, um, uh, for a few hundred million years. And these dark ages are extremely interesting. And many new efforts are trying to look at what happens at the end of the dark ages. Um, so here's a, here's a picture of that. Uh, the universe is dark because there were no fully populated atoms. There were only ions in the first uh, 400 million years. And the ions filter out all the electromagnetic radiation. So you have to wait until these ions disappear and become full atoms before light can travel. And that happens roughly at 300 million uh, years. And so at that point, galaxies begin to form. Uh, and at the moment, people are beginning to look what happens right at that. And these are not the shapes from stars and galaxies. These are shapes of big hydrogen bubbles and so on that people are looking for, very different things than um, you've seen so far on, on astronomy in images. Um, so th this is a major problem at the moment, what happened during this, this period. So another very interesting thing has to do with things like gravitational waves. 
um, almost all of the detection of gravitational waves and uh, many other interesting radiation problems involve two very heavy things that rotate around each other. For example, uh, a pulsar around a black hole um, is like a clock going around a black hole. And Einstein already realized that the clock will be affected by the black hole. And uh, making detailed measurements is very interesting. So SKA can help here in two ways. First of all, its sensitivity allows us to detect the perturbations, which are roughly one in 20 digits. Yeah, so we're, we're dealing with um, an unbelievably small variation coming uh, from uh, ra in the radiation and uh, indicating that there might be a gravitational wave behind it. Yeah. Uh, another interesting fact for you is that um, gravitational waves um, have nanohertz frequency ranges, so they they oscillate, you know, once in a few years or so. Yeah, um, light has frequencies that are something like 25 digits orders of magnitude on the other side. So, so really, astronomy is is looking at numbers over spectacular ranges with increasing precision. Yeah, and. I'm not saying that there is immediate applicability for positives here, but there could be. Yeah. Um, surprisingly, um, the SKA will likely see all pulsars in our galaxy. There are about 30,000, we think, and just imagine that you could see all of them. Yeah, that's, that's kind of a feat that nobody was expecting 20, 30 years ago. So astrophysics is taking over the sort of prominent seed that physics has had in discovering fundamental issues in physics like forces, matter and so on. Yeah, the, the number of results that is flowing in, it's, it's unbelievable. Just like in the 1970s, particle accelerators were the hottest thing on the planet. Yeah, and now we, we're way out there looking at the next generation of new data. And it's all very different from uh, what it was t uh, 10, 20 years ago. Okay, so let's start moving in the direction of computing. So an interferometer is uh, a telescope that uses multiple antennas. Uh, but I see people taking pictures. Uh, we'll put these slides on the web right away. Yeah, so th th there's nothing secret in them that you can't retrieve from uh, uh, the, the web later. So the, the interferometers were invented in World War II to uh, act like radar systems in Allied planes in Britain. And uh, they uh, use the interference of two magnetic waves, electromagnetic waves, to detect the signal. Um, there are some nasty equations, uh, and then there are some very simple ones. For example, the maximum distance between these antennas, which I said is around 100 or 200 kilometers, tells you the resolution, the smallest uh, thing that you can see. And then the field of view has to do with the diameter of the dish. Yeah, and so that uh, is not dependent on the whole array, it's dependent on the individual dishes. Um, if the radio telescope was, as it is in the upper picture, on a flat earth, yeah, and the uh, sky horizon that we see was also flat, then the problem would be relatively simple. The interferometer problem then reduces to a Fourier transform, uh, and so you get the images, the, 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 uh, the light strengths back from the measured interferometry signals just by Fourier transforming. Things unfortunately get very, very complicated because the Earth is round, the sky is round, the Earth rotates, and there is uh, things like atmospheric distortion of the radiation. And so a relatively innocent problem actually turns into a very nasty a numerical problem for which exact solutions are in there. It has lots of parameters and it isn't very clean, as a mathematician would say. So, Astronomy 101, what happens in that thing? Yeah, um, I'll have to turn my head to read the slide here a little bit. So, at the antennas, there are things like waveguides and so on initially, but it ends with digitizing. And so, that's where you get your first digital signal. Uh, which, by the way, has a precision of one bit, yeah, so you don't need um, uh, big numbers for that. Then this goes into the correlator, which takes every pair of antenna signals, averages them for a few seconds or a fraction of a second, and 
uh, in the averaging process, the accuracy is greatly improved, noise is removed. Um, of course, you also lose time resolution of your signal, but, but that's to be expected. And so, out of the um, correlator, every uh, 0.3 seconds or so, you get three complex numbers. And uh, this is done for every pair of antennas and for 64,000 frequency bands. So that's the color range that the telescope sees. If you multiply these numbers together, you roughly get one terabyte per second. Yeah, that's um, a very high data rate for an I.O. system. And this uh, one terabyte per second travels from the telescope to Perth and from the telescope to Cape Town. Yeah, so this has to go over wide area networking Minimizing the precision here is very important, yet this is an expensive network to carry so much data. So these correlated signals then hit this supercomputer and they are collected for about six hours. And the reason is the following, that all these experiments end within 12 hours because you start looking at something but the Earth rotates and so within 12 hours you rotate it out of view. In practice, the, uh, the time you really want to be looking at it is more three to six hours, uh, because after that, uh, the angle of view that you have has so much atmosphere in it that the image isn't very good. Yeah, so we're talking about collecting this terabyte per second for a bunch of hours, and then starting to process it to create images. There is in parallel another thing going on that is looking at so-called transients, very quick things that happen like explosions of stars uh, and, and other radio bleeps and that's called detecting transients. Yeah? And these transients, they are the newspaper material. Yeah? When a transient is found, some astronomer may call another telescope and say, please look at that thing, I think there's something exciting going on. And if you look at the LIGO detection of gravitational waves, it's really a story of all kinds of people calling each other in one evening and together looking at that gravitational wave. Yeah, and, and a, a day later they came away with an astonishing amount of information that without the telephone wouldn't have been done. Funnily enough, the telephone really is important here. Yeah, people got called away out of seminars and so on. It's a very nice story to read. Good. So there are only two data types in this computation that are really important. <laughs> so one is the so-called input data or visibilities, and these have the same strange shape as the telescope layout, but they are actually all the difference vectors between two telescopes. Yes, yeah, still you get roughly the same shape of the spirals, but you also see rotation in it because the <coughs> Earth rotates, so your spirals actually sweep out quite a lot of area in the end. Um, the second data type is much more straightforward. It is a grid on which you find the images, and that grid is not small. It's roughly 100k by 100k, uh, so that um, the, the output of that image uh, is easy for you to compute now. Uh, you have uh, 100k by 100k by 64,000 colors, and that leads to an image size that is, I think, five orders of magnitude larger than what you get from a cell phone or so. Yeah, so the photographs that you get, or the images that you would get when you want to look at them, they would need big walls to be pasted on. It's not something that you want to analyze by hand anymore, which is what people did until recently. Yeah, the, the amount of detail in the images is so large that you will need computer analysis to find things. That's not what the telescope does. Yeah, that's what the astronomers do later when the images are delivered to them. So um, here's a story about the going back to a flat Earth. Yeah. Sorry, did this image arrive every day or every five seconds? <coughs> I didn't catch. Uh, they arrive every five hours, roughly. Yeah. Uh, so after you've had one of these periods, and and there are a bunch of different kinds of images, but they they all look a little bit like the universe. Uh, so here, I, I'm going to sk skip this one. This is, uh, has to do with going back to a, a flat telescope uh, model. So he, here's a 
very simple picture of an imaging pipeline. So the imaging pipelines take this visibility data and they do actually fairly ordinary things like Fourier transforms, convolutions with filters, subtractions and so on. Nothing so special, but the data volume is very, very large and it's very sparse sometimes because of this visibility data that's so unusual. Um, if you um, so, so to, to some degree, the problems are subtle. Yeah? They, they, they don't involve truly new ideas, but they are different because the data has such a different shape and such a different volume. Yeah, that, that distinguishes the telescope pipelines in the what is called the science data processor part from like a cell phone camera processor, which is just much more straightforward. So here's a relative kernel cost picture. Um, there are roughly six or seven algorithms that will be run. Uh, so these are different ways of imaging. For example, you sometimes average over frequencies, sometimes you don't, and so on. And so you get six or seven different pipelines. What jumps out here is that the Fourier transform, which is the orange thing, is actually the biggest thing. Um, Another one that turns out to be very big is the so-called gridding, which uh, deals with that irregular data and puts it on a regular grid. Yeah, so there's gridding and degridding um, that uh, also take, take a lot of data. Um, there is you know, a significant computational effort here. Um, the total you see in this picture is 30 petaflops sustained. Uh, that's actually a rather low estimate um, and but I will not go into that at the moment why why it is rather low so the approach that the SDP team has taken is um, first of all they have to be conservative yeah it's not a computer science product uh, project uh, they, they just need to get data to astronomers um, there are very deep mathematical questions. So for example, is the interferometry approach really correct? Almost certainly it's no longer. Yeah, this was modeled on an aircraft with two antennas. Why would this work with 100,000 antennas in the same way? Yeah, it looks, it looks very primitive. Uh, so that's one of the deeper questions, namely is the fundamental approach to the data analysis even correct? But that can be tackled right now. Yeah, it's fine for people to research it, but that would uh, be too risky to change it. Um, a detailed parametric model was made of all these pipelines, um, like how many operations are needed for every step, what um, data movement is involved. And a shocking number came out of that. The shocking number that came out was that the memory bandwidth that is required is 200 petabytes per second. Yeah, so that's um, you know, 0 0.2 exabyte per second of uh, data movement in your computer. And this is after cache reuse. Yeah, so this is honest data movement that needs to be tackled. That number is a factor 10 ahead of the first exascale machines planned for the, for the early 20s. Yeah, and so this is a a big engineering challenge that we'll talk more about. Um, another very important thing about this telescope is that the telescope life will be around 50 years. Computer lives are much shorter. Yeah, they, they are going up a little bit with Moore's law declining, but they're still probably only like six years or seven years, and then you'll throw away a supercomputer. You know? Um, so there will be many refreshes of the computing technology, particularly um, given all the new things that we're seeing at the moment. Agility will be very important to adapt to the new computers. Also, every new radio telescope has shown problems with previous algorithms, and so when it is first deployed, a lot of assumptions will have to be revisited. Yep. So agility is very important. So here are a few samples of the considerations. So the the ingest uh, into the central signal processing, that is what this correlator did here, yeah, the averaging is massive, yeah, um, and uh, it, it reduces um, the data, the correlator, by, by quite a lot. So when it comes out, it is this one terabyte per second signal that goes over 500 kilometers in the direction of these supercomputers. Um, one terabyte per second is roughly um, 
a hundred petabytes per day, you know, roughly 10 to the power of five seconds in a day. And so, you know, a hundred petabytes of data movement in a day is, is significant. Yeah? And that's what the supercomputing will be receiving. Um, the computers that are planned will have roughly 300 petaflop of computing power. And if you relate that to the 30 petaflop sustained number that we need, that's a 10% efficiency. So it's actually a very efficient pr uh, program. Yeah, and it's quite quite good if you can do that. Um, I think you, you, here we see um, a little bit of the relationship between other subsystems. So yes, there is a control system that points the telescope and say, okay, start ingesting now. Yeah, and then we get the data stream we just discussed and that's placed in the archive for people to consume. Um, so yet another picture here is uh, where is the 100 petaflops, yeah, the, the 200 petaflops per second of data movement. So that actually happens in the middle of this pipeline, yeah, and the, the pipeline, as we saw, is mostly doing Fourier transforms, yeah, and the movement between memory and the processing elements, that is what, what leads to this data movement. Um, the ingest uh, is one terabyte per second. Funnily enough, it has to be read around 10 times. So the read bandwidth on this input data is a, actually a, also a world leading IO number of 10 terabytes per second. The good news is that it is rather decoupled I.O., so it is not so difficult perhaps to achieve this number, but it is very, very high. And what you're beginning to smell here is what would the value be of reducing the precision? Yeah, it would relate to really major expenses in these compute systems and major challenges even. Um, Here's a very beautiful picture. How does the caching actually work? Well, it turns out that it relates very directly to the Earth rotating. And so when you take a step in your computation, you rotate a few things out of the cache and, and a few other things into the cache. And so really what is fetched is sort of the, the edges of things that have been rotated in, into view and out of view. Yeah, it's quite, quite pretty that that shows up at some detail. And so filling the edges is your 200 petabyte per second. Yeah. Um, here's then a model of the computer. So these computers should cost roughly um, you know, 50, 60 uh, million dollars. It's kind of a low cost, what people say, but that's all the money there is. Power plants, you know, storage. So it's to some degrees a little bit less challenging than the exaflop systems, except for that bandwidth number, which is just way out there. Yeah, and, and this the bandwidth number makes this a very interesting problem because the, it, the solution isn't really on the horizon. We're now going to look at how this can be tackled, uh, probably just, just about adequately. So first of all, in, in 2013, the problem looked completely out of reach. But right around that time, people became aware uh, that HBM was going to be replacing RAM in many ways. And that gives it 10 times improvement. Yeah, so HBM is a on-package memory product with a RAM interface, but it has many, many more cables or on-chip connections to the CPU, so the bandwidth is 10 times higher than RAM. Um, the interesting thing is that by delays that were picked up in the design, the design was I think supposed to be complete in 2016 or so or 2015, these three or four years turned out to be incredibly helpful because we could ride on the back of new developments in memory yeah, and things that looked impossible uh, became possible just by waiting. Yeah, and uh, this is something that you normally can't really say, you know, a delay is always considered a, a disaster but not if you have a problem that you can't solve. Yeah, in this case, it just slowly enabled what we needed to do. So, surprisingly enough, a domain-specific accelerator like the Google TPU that has been uh, developed very recently, the version 3 TPU, can actually deliver this bandwidth in 10,000 machines. 
Um, 10,000 machines is a lot of machines, yeah, but it is a normal size for a high-end supercomputer. Previously, we were looking at at least a factor 10 more to achieve the bandwidth, and that's completely out of reach. Yeah, so, so computing systems with 100,000 systems, to my knowledge, haven't been built. Yeah, the, the biggest I'm aware of that have been built had 60,000 nodes or so uh, collaborating. And uh, being in the 10,000 range is very, very promising. Yeah, and so um, what is interesting about that is that this is a new domain in chip design. It's very domain-specific design. Yeah, the TPU, by the way, may not solve all the SKA problems because it was built for AI, it wasn't built for image pipelines, but a design like this could do the telescope work in 10,000 computers. Yeah. On the other hand, um, how do you get an accelerator like that if you're the only customer? Yeah, that you have to come with a problem at the moment that has enough generality that people actually want to build your chip. Yeah, but this is changing building chips will be cheaper in five or ten years. So there's something software-wise, largely, that we can do that is much more promising, I think, than uh, building a, a TPU-like element. Um, so what, what happened is that precision and error propagation analysis, analysis was a very popular mathematics subject in the 1960s. And you know, there were beautiful books by people like Wilkinson, who was you know, one of the founders of numerical uh, linear algebra about error handling. And then it went completely out of fashion. At some point, these 64-bit numbers came around and everybody said, there are errors are just not an issue and nobody today almost is doing any serious error analysis yeah people just compute and say the precision is so high nothing will go wrong what they don't realize is that they are paying you know incredible amounts of money to move all these 64 bit numbers around yeah and i've shown you pretty large numbers here yeah that that are a big a big deal so fortunately um, uh, by the way, there is a side effect of using high precision numbers that is not emphasized enough in the propaganda, I think. So, so John, listen carefully. This is a, g a very good message for you to also carry around. Namely, if you work with numbers with a very high precision, but you have only like five significant digits or so, your tail end is error noise. Error noise doesn't compress. So all kinds of mechanisms, yeah? So, so you're always, almost always describing something that is a smooth shape. And so these five significant digits, they will vary in very reasonable ways. They will compress like they do in images and that sort of thing, but not the tail end of that number, yeah? Dragging the garbage along is incompressible data. And so there's, there's a secondary problem that comes from working at the wrong precision. Yeah? So these are very, very important things that are beginning to get a lot of attention. I think the AI people um, were very, very helpful in also bringing this to the foreground, yeah? just like, of course, uh, the UNUM and POSIT effort has. Uh, so um, for SKA, a good example is, I already mentioned, the antenna signals themselves have like one bit of information, yeah, they are being moved as 32-bit numbers, yeah, uh, so why do you do that, yeah, and, and similarly, you know, the one terabyte per second pipeline from the correlator to the computer is moved at 32 bits, I don't know if it can be done with 16 bits, but if it was 17 bits, that would still be very, very good. That would be halving the cost of that network. Yeah? And so this area, you can also see every bit helps. Yeah? So the science data processor itself would mostly use 64-bit numbers, but that's nowhere close to the actual resolution that you find in images. Yeah, that number is way too high. We know that, but we don't know yet how to work around it. Yeah? And here's a suggestion how this will work. So the opportunity is to build a system that deals with data movement, at least, at the right precision. Yeah? So if you are hauling that data 500 kilometers through the desert, only haul the significant bits. Get rid of the rest. Yeah? And then maybe in the compute systems, there is only IEEE floating point numbers probably to work. So at some point, you convert this back for computational purposes 
but you do it in very clever ways. Yeah, so you don't move these large numbers over the memory bus. You instead get it into the cache in a small format, do your conversions and start computing. Yeah, so there's a very simple proposal that says move data at the appropriate precision and convert it when you have to. Yeah, because in, in the first generation of the telescope there won't really uh, be uh, posit hardware yet. So, um, as we've seen, you know, we're, we're talking about significant numbers, yeah? I think at least 50% reduction in the requirements, maybe more. Um, so this could bring the cost of the computer down by something like 25 to 50%. Yeah, so this is enormous, yeah? And it's a good example where a relatively small software effort, yeah, what I'm talking about here is not really wizardry, yeah, it's, it's totally possible to convert between number formats at line rates and so on, it's not so hard, um, could have very big impact on ongoing hardware costs. On top of that, one would be ready for the future if you have the new formats and you're used to being much more careful with your floating point data yeah, you are in very good shape to replace this with a future Risk Five computer from Gustafsson and company. Yeah, they uh, they will have better floating point units in maybe five or ten years time. So I also want to mention both capacity and bandwidth are affected by this. Yeah, if you store smaller numbers, you also need less space to do so. Uh, the bandwidth, though, is the overwhelming cost factor. So in the long term, yeah, a mixed precision UNUM system would be very valuable, yeah, that could handle all these things without conversions, with beautiful parametrization, um, and that would be very good. Uh, in the short term, this plan can still be executed, yeah, we can use the idle cycles, which are 70 to 90 percent uh, of the time the compute units are doing nothing, that should be ample to do conversions of the data back and forth without really affecting the stream of data except for reducing the memory bandwidth. Yeah, it won't cause delay in the computations really. Um, a very delicate issue here is the following. Controlling your data is actually very, very hard. So if you convert a posit number to an IEEE number here we must prevent that IEEE number from ever hitting the memory bus. Yeah, the moment it starts traveling back to RAM, we've caused a disaster. There are no reasonable APIs to control caches at the moment. Yeah, so there's research work showing that, that this is very valuable. There are machine instructions in the back of the Intel processor manual, yeah, and they do actually fairly terrible things. They turn the whole caching off or something like that. Yeah, this is really not an area in which sufficient research has been done. Yeah, so there are even challenges here on controlling this data. Yeah, you have to constrain it from <coughs> polluting your, your bandwidth. Good. So uh, I, I formed a group of experts working on this. Um, I, I'd been dreaming about this for some years and I knew of John's work and so uh, we have a, a small team now evaluating the Fourier transform yeah? and, and we hope in the, in the next few months to sort of write a strategic report saying, you know, here's an example, it works, yeah? and these are the recommendations for data formats. But I think you get the hang of it. Yeah? Posits are very important. So for the posit community, um, there are two important messages. This is one grand challenge problem that is out there at the moment dealing with SKA data. It's by the way mentioned in the brochure of the conference, yeah, the other picture of SKA. I think the picture I picked was much better because I took the artist impression for a few years. They actually took a photograph of the real thing and the image of an artist is often much nicer than the reality. Yeah, so. <laughs> um, so, but there will be very many similar ones. Yeah, they're, they're almost all problems are bottlenecked on memory bandwidth, and same trick would work. Secondly, um, we have a linear relationship, more or less, between costs and number of bits we move. So I am making a plea to keep variable ranges and precision in the number format available. Yeah, don't start jumping by factors of two. These are rather big 
numbers, yeah, and these these numbers in between might be very valuable also. Yeah, they might be very awkward to compute with, but not if you serialize it on a wire and you need to pull it across. Yeah. So uh, here are a few conclusions to, to wrap up with. Um, maybe it's interesting above all to see how computing is, you know, totally central to a radio telescope. Yeah, I mean, who would have thought that? This is the first radio telescope that requires a massive cluster to do anything. Yeah, and uh, it's it's interesting how deep the computing problems are. So astrophysics at the moment has everybody's attention. Yeah, it's in the newspaper every day. I mean, are you, how can they do this? Yeah, it's the best news every day is there's another black hole here or wave there. Yeah, they, they really have captured the imagination. So this project can't fail and there's a great opportunity to capitalize on the enthusiasm yeah and use this money in sensible ways to further lots of things yeah not just physics and astrophysics but also computing yeah and so i i think th this makes it a very worthwhile opportunity to look at um i think uh, this could be a showcase for positive arithmetic very very clearly yeah and um uh, we we just have to wait that the intuition we have which looks very very reliable to me is actually playing out yeah but um that that will probably be all be all be good yeah and we will know that quite soon so thank you very much questions um hey, from uh, in uh, thank you very much for this, this excellent talk, it's very motivating. Uh, Is this on? I, the, there's one point where the, the numbers don't exactly match. It's, <laughs> you, you, you have the, this resolution, at some point you said you have a resolution of 1 to the 10 to the 20, 1 divided by 10 to the 20, and that doesn't fit the uh, double position number. So this, this resolution uh, is beyond the, the accuracy of, of even double precision. So you, you have to have this kind of... Uh, so so let me tell you where that, that, where that number actually comes from, roughly. Yeah, so this number comes from sifting through telescope data for many years to find one of these kind of phenomena. So there's no... It, it's in, in time, it's not in, 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 Indeed, this, in the this data. Indeed, includes also the time as a resolution element. Yeah, so, th so statistically you're only going to see an event like that every, uh, you know, uh, I think it's the order of a few years is, is what was expected. Yeah. Um, of course, the, the moment more understanding arrives about this data, people can sharpen the observation of it, yeah, and so it could easily go down an order of magnitude uh, like it is with gravitational waves right now. Yeah, that finding the first one was incredibly hard, but since then, I think we've already spotted a few hundred or so, yeah, which is amazing in just a few years now. Other questions? So just when you talk about the, the, long, tail, the long tail with all the rubbish behind, so it's, uh, does it affect the accuracy of the results? For a 64-bit number with all the rubbish behind. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I think that's sort of philosophically a rather deep question. You know, like is some some pattern in the rubbish ultimately having a good effect? But certainly the error analysis, like it is done in numerical analysis, does not assume that. Yeah. So the the reliable uh, accuracy guarantees about, for example, uh, related to condition numbers or so as they propagate through an algorithm, yeah, they do not take into account very subtle effects behind the errors, yeah, they are just saying there are so many significant digits and uh, only that data is used to guarantee precision of the outcome. Yeah, so while it is possible that there would be some magic effect, nobody is counting on it. Yeah, the, the numerical analysis state of the art is to not include very subtle effects that might be in the error messages, in the error digits. Are you f are referring to assumptions or? I, I, I assumption. It's 
it's a technical assumption. Yes, it's yes. So when you when you select <coughs> an algorithm and you analyze its precision, you will say, for example, uh, take a Fourier transform. Yeah, there there is some error bound that says the error will the error will amplify by this amount if we perform the Fourier transform on this data. That error bound is is a you know a theoretical number from numerical analysis. It does not include the sort of subtlety that you're hinting at. Yeah? And so in the design of your system, these magic effects that might be in the remaining digits are not used. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and by the way, it's not known that they are there. And given how incredibly noisy the signals themselves are, so this, the, the input signal here already has a large amount of that noise in these digits, I think it's extraordinarily unlikely that for the telescope problem, yeah, the remaining digits have much value. They could have value in you know, a very clean problem where you have infinite precision going in. Yeah, in that case, you will probably develop some magic patterns in the error numbers, but n not not with noisy input. Have I answered your question? Otherwise, we take it up over a cup of coffee. Yeah. Uh, uh. Thanks, Peter, for your talk. Um, are you thinking in terms of uh, extending instruction sets, or uh, you know, having compression um, for things like TPUs? Uh, what are your thoughts in terms of what you're thinking the hardware would look like? Would you, you know, take a risk five instruction set or synthesize something specifically? Because Xilinx will now give you FPGAs with HPM on board now. They, they do actually. It, it's actually HMC, uh, but but the high-end memory systems are present in the. So when you buy a big FPGA, a large part of the cost you pay is for a very high-end memory system that's embedded. Um, I would love to talk about your question. What, like, what would you actually need at the instruction set level? This is where my own research is mostly focused on the, what you could call low-level system software to make these things go fast. And yes, to deal with memory effectively, uh, some new instructions are extremely valuable. They depend on the memory type that you're working with and so on, and uh, expressing it then as usable APIs for a compiler or for a programmer is a whole different uh, question. Uh, so it's an extremely interesting question, but I really fear it would take like like at least sort of 15 minutes to get the discussion started. So grab me over coffee, yeah, and, and then shut me off before the next talk starts. Yeah, and the, uh, yeah. All right. All right. And we have a, a <coughs> gift to give you, a souvenir from Thank you. Uh, Singapore. And thank you very, let's thank our speaker again. Yeah.